Stephen, are you? Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, today we are very lucky to have Chile. Uh, she's a postdoc at Princeton University, advised by Jason, and she got her PhD from UT Austin uh, from uh, this May. Um, she visited IAS um, last year. Um, she also uh, visited uh, Simons Institute for the Foundation of Deep Learning program uh, last summer. Uh, so her main research interests are machine learning, deep learning, optimization, and she has received several awards, including two years of Computing Innovative Fellowship and Simon Berkeley Research Fellowship. And today she'll talk about uh, self-suppressed learning. So I'll move to Chi. Okay, thank you, Simon. Uh, so today I will talk about uh, predicting what you already know helps. Um, a provable way to interpret self-supervised learning. And this is joint work with Jason Lee, uh, Nikwinch, and Jia Chen. So we all know that deep learning is very successful with abundant labeled data. However, in practice, uh, it is very rare to have so much labeled data. And, uh, also, just learning from lots of labels and re reinforce the knowledge might not be similar to how humans and animals learn. As humans, we might distill some patches of features from the observations and uh, establish knowledge based on those patches. And the, the corresponding term in learning theory might be the, the representation of the data. And uh, many believe that the success of deep learning is due to learning such useful representations. And uh, well, representations can be learned on unlabeled data. And the uh, feature representations also can transfer to other tasks. So they have some advantages, while competing methods lack transferability early. Uh, so what do we mean by deep representation learning? So the very simple algorithm looks like this. When we are given several or one tasks, um, we train a network that has some shared layers and uh, some task-specific layers uh, as the head that are closer to the output part. And uh, we will treat uh, those shared parts as a common representation, uh, keep them and discard the head. And when we are given some downstream tasks, we will train a layer on top of it. We might also fine tune uh, this representation. Uh, in this way, really we can show that we have some reduced sample uh, complexity. So this kind of representation learning has a lot of applications. For example, in domain without enough data, enough label data, and uh, even in applications with lots of label data, like, like ImageNet, sometimes people can also show that they benefit with self-supervised pre-training. They can also improve the performance with self-supervised learning. And in language model, it's been used for years. We can predict missing words from other part. And in transfer learning, meta learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, SSL, or self-supervised learning, or representation learning have all been useful. One important success story of representation learning is through self-supervised learning, or SSL. The intuition is the data annotation is very expensive, so it will be important to create our own labels from the input data without human annotations. So here comes the self-supervised learning. In a nutshell, what it does is to predict functions of the input from other parts. And there are various ways to design such self-supervised learning tasks, or usually referred as pretext tasks. Uh, for instance, in denoising autoencoder, what we do is we take some plain images, add noise to it, and create some noisy input and train an encoder and decoder such, as, such that the output is the denoised image. 
uh, in this way, um, we can use this middle part to compress representation and uh, use it for future downstream tasks. And for context encoder, we simply just um, take some uh, image patches and uh, predict those image patch from the other part of the boundary and uh, train a decoder encoder and again use the encoder as the um, representation. And in language model, uh, we, we can predict next word from the from the other part, we can upload uh, some parts of the language and uh, use the remaining part predicted. And for image colorization, so we can divide the image in a flexible way. We do not need to just use image patch as the pretext pre task. We can divide it as a color channel and a grayscale image and uh, the, just predict the image from the other part. And uh, some other ways of SSL, um, perhaps recently quite um, popular, is the contrastive learning. So what it does is take images and create um, multiple views of it through some kind of transformations, such as distortion and uh, uh, remove color channel, etc. And then they learn a representation on top of those uh, different fields. And with the representations, they, they um, learn some functions such that they maximize the agreement of the images come from the same image, where they will repair the representations that comes from different images. That is uh, contrastive learning. And they use this representation as the, um, to help them train the downstream tasks. And uh, for contrastive learning, perhaps uh, the idea behind is different views of the images also share should share similarities, should share representations. So these are different kinds of pretext tasks for SSL. And uh, the question is, do they work? Uh, and the answer is yes. Like uh, this SimCLR, which is a recently very popular SSL model, they can show that on ImageNet, they use contrastive, lear contrastive learning to learn some representations and then just train a linear layer on top of it. On top of it, it can sometimes outperform supervised learning uh, performance. And also it is also good for, for transfer learning. Like what they do is they, they have learned this pre-training representation for ImageNet and then they transfer this representation to 10 different tasks. These are 10 different data sets that are uh, images, but not similar as ImageNet. And they can see that with fixed representations, I mean, they do not do fine tune and just uh, wrap a linear layer on top of it, on top of it with self surface learning, they, their performance is even better than with supervised learning. I mean, they, they get the pre-training um, model from ImageNet and uh, uh, wrap a linear layer on top of it with them. And uh, this, those are with fixed representations. And if they do fine tuning, meaning that uh, they take the representation as the pre-training model and they fine tune a little bit of the representation and also wrap a linear layer on it, then they can also show better performance with a supervised learning model or with random initialization. So now that we know that self-supervised learning works, we are, interest, we are interested to know why does it work? Why does predicting parts of the input could possibly help us? 
it's quite mysterious because uh, you see in the procedure, there's no actual information. We already improved the entire input. We deliberately occlude some parts of the input and predict it. So our hope is the learned representation can possibly keep the relevant parts of the label condition on input such that a simple classifier like linear model will work. But how? And that is the question uh, we want to answer today. There are some prior work on contrastive learning, but maybe focused more on contrastive learning. Um, so Arara et al, they showed that uh, when, when they have access to data that comes from uh, some clusters, and they can sample the data from the other clusters, they can essentially learn a mean classifier. And uh, Tosh et al, they also study contrastive learning but in a limited um, domain in topic model. So their result is limited to their design generated models of the data. And uh, there is also understanding on multi-view learning. So Foster and uh, Kakade, when they proposed this, self-supervised learning was not even proposed, but actually multi-view learning actually share some similarities. And uh, there were also some information bottleneck explanations, but perhaps not very quantitative to the sample complexity improvement we want to achieve. So in this talk, we consider specific, specifically these kinds of SSL learning procedure. So we take the input and divide it in, into two parts. X2 is the image patch we want to predict. And X1 is the bounding box, the other part of the image. Uh, and uh, the pretext task is simply to predict X2 from X1. And uh, we learn this Psi as the representation. And for downstream task, we will keep this Psi and only learn a linear layer on top of it. So this is quite similar to the procedure of SSL. And uh, this image is just a context encoder, so predict image patch from the other parts. But uh, remember, in this talk, um, how we divide x1, x2 is actually flexible. So we can also think about x2 as the color channel and x1 as the, the other part, the grid scale image. Yeah. And uh, again, formally, our algorithm is we have the input and we part partition it into x1 and x2. x2 might be a small patch, and x1 is the remainder of image. And uh, we set up the pretext task x. We train a Psi, the representation, to predict x2. And uh, typically, Psi is uh, some encoder and the decoder. Uh, but uh, in this talk, we will say that we, our representation is just Psi. But uh, uh, in real applications, people really just only take E, the encoder. But uh, uh, this is actually some variance and uh, uh, can be built as extension of our main result. But in this work, let's keep it simple. Um, and then for downstream task, we consider finite sample case that uh, we have NL labeled samples and uh, learn y from Psi x1 representation and only learn a linear model. Okay. So let's uh, refresh our memory, recap on the uh, notations. Our label is y and the uh, input is x1. A pretext uh, pre task is to predict x2 from x1. And there is also some latent variables I haven't talked about, but uh, uh, later I will talk about what it is, what it is, what it means, and how it will enter our results. And uh, in this work, our key assumption is x1, the input, x2, the pretext pre task target, are 
almost approximately conditional independent given y and some latent variable z. Or using the language of graphic model, just this kind of chain rule. So it roughly means to predict x2 from x1, we have implicitly learned y and z already. This might not uh, look so clear and uh, intuitive why we should uh, assume this, but let's look at some examples. For example, we want to do image colorization of photos from desert, forest, and sea. So in this case, X2 is the color channel. So roughly speaking, it's just uh, yellow for desert, um, green for forest, and the blue for seas. And X1 is grayscale image, and Y is a label, so it's the kinds of images. Um, and in this example, actually X1 and X2 are more are conditional independent given y, meaning that to predict x2, to predict the color, we might not even need to refer to x1 if we have the knowledge of y. So basically, if we have been able to predict, predict x2, predict the color, we have implicitly already know what y is. So this is exact conditional independence. But of course, this is very ideal. We just want to build up to our main assumption, which is um, x1 and x2 might be conditional independent or approximately conditional independent given y and z. So for example, here, when we want to predict this image patch from the bounding box, maybe y is the, lab when y is the label of the images, like y equals to building, we, not, we might not be able to predict what it looks like. But if we have, given some other knowledge like the style of the image uh, or whether it has windows and some other actual information, we, we might be able to fill out this patch more accurately and the variance of X2 becomes smaller given Y and Z. So in this case, we say that X1 is almost, is approximately conditional independent with X2 given Y and Z. And uh, uh, it's not very clear what Z is, but we do not need to know what it is, but it will just enter the uh, result we have. I mean, the algorithm does not need to know Z. Um, so, so here you may think that um, we, we might, a naive way to choose Z is uh, it, we just choose X2 or X1, then this is automatically satisfied. But, but uh, that's not very good because our result, um, the sample complexity will depend on the dimension of Z. So if Z is very large, then uh, it does not give us a good performance. So here we roughly means that uh, X1 and X2's uh, drawing information, uh, their similarities are captured by some Y and Z. And, uh, to understand how uh, self-supervised learning can possibly improve our performance, let's look at some warm-up example, so, which is the linear case. The pretext task, again, is just to learn x2 from x1 with a linear uh, representation. So here we use a b to, to denote it. And the B just minimize the difference from X2 and Bx1. Uh, when we get this representation, we will learn the linear layer W on top of it. So compare this, this procedure, this simple procedure with just learn a linear layer directly. So in the linear case, this result, so learn the model directly has a closed form, which uh, which we can derive it and see that theta can actually uh, be represented as B W star plus the partial correlation sigma x1 x2 given y times some um, matrix. Uh, this is not clear uh, by if you look at um, directly but uh, um, with some calculations, you can get it. 
So we can see if x1 and x2 are their partial correlation is zero, and uh, x1, x2 condition on y, uh, condition independent given y, uh, is a stronger assumption, then partial correlation is zero. Then theta is exactly b times w star. And uh, this means that this procedure, we do not lose anything. So it is sufficient to just use b to predict y. And uh, however, notice that to predict y from x1, this theta learns, uh, learns from d1 dimension of, of information. While if we just use b to predict, uh, predict y, uh, we can show that b is actually of dimension k. Therefore, to, to learn w, we only need other k uh, number of samples. So why is b uh, dimension k? It roughly comes from the conditional independence assumption because x1 and x2, their joint information is only captured from y. So to predict x2, only like k-dimensional of information is useful. We call that y, y's dimension is k. Yes. So this is how that uh, self-supervised learning can help us to reduce the sample complexity. Roughly speaking, it just uh, from the learning procedure, from the pretext task, we have um, implicitly select only k-dimensional of useful information. So if we learn from y directly from x1, we will need d1 dimensional information because we have not select anything. But with this pretext task, we will only use uh, k-dimensional samples. But what if uh, the partial correlation is big? So we can consider some latent variable z implicitly, such that x1 is almost conditional independent of x2 given y and z, or, or almost partially uncorrelated. And their partial correlation is captured as the norm of, uh, actually here is the, the Frobenius norm of sigma x1, x2 given y and z. And uh, we can show that our risk is upper bounded by k plus m, the dimension of y plus the dimension of the latent variable z divided by the number of samples uh, plus the error caused from, uh, from partial, uncorrela uh, partial correlation plus some error. Uh, so epsilon three is the accuracy of learning pretext task. Uh, we can as assume it to be very small because um, for pretext tasks, we are only using unlabeled data. So we can always assume we have abundant data. And uh, in this case, the sample complexity is reduced from dimension D1 to roughly dimension K plus M. And uh, here, beta is roughly captures the correlation of YZ and X2. So YZ cannot be uncorrelated with X2. Uh, so a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you assume a specific form of uh, x1, x2 given z? Like how the dimension of z enters the, your uh, formulation? If this is a specific like, linear form or some other uh, depend like form of dependencies? Uh, yes, so here is linear case. So, so this sigma x1, x2 given yz uh, captures their uh, linear correlations. Uh, but in the first term, k plus m or in L, the, uh, you also assume some linearity here to have a dependency on m? Oh, so I forgot to mention m is the dimension of z, dimension of the uh, latent variable. And it's also a linear, uh, let's say linear function, um, I, like say, X1 is linear function of Z or something like this? Oh, so uh, in this case, we, we don't need. Uh, uh, so if, 
Okay, so so if uh, y is a linear function of x1, uh, this all works. Uh, if it's not, uh, here risk means that we compare the best linear compared to the best linear function. And uh, we also need to assume that approximation error is bounded by uh, k over n or k plus m over n, uh, which is standard. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. Yes. Okay, and for general function class, we consider the case where the label y is discrete. And uh, so let's keep it simple. It's, if it's just multi-class labels, y is of dimension k, and the uh, yi is just zero one. one. This is just the one hot encoded representation of the, of the labels. And this, in this case, we can learn an arbitrary function to predict x2 from x1. So g, g can be an arbitrary function that minimizes this uh, MSE. And uh, then we, again, we learn a W star, which is a linear layer on top of the representation. And uh, compared to this procedure with F star, which is the best uh, prediction function of Y given X1, then we have this following result. If x1 is and x2 are independent given y, then actually this f star is exactly equal to w star times Poisson x1. So if conditional independence is exactly satisfied, then the optimal function actually we can achieve it with a linear model if we have learned Poisson x1. And the Psi x1, uh, no matter how many data we have, uh, Psi x1 will, will also be dimension k. And uh, uh, if we have finite labels for the downstream task, we will only need other k samples. This is actually kind of amazing uh, because f star here, it can be arbitrary function. It can be very complicated. However, if we have learned Psi, we can show that it is a linear, only a linear layer. Uh, to help us understand the, the performance, we are, we, let's look at uh, an example. So uh, also it is uh, quite interesting that uh, to use Psi to predict Y is better than use X2 to predict Y, because you may think that oh, Psi is just to predict x2 from x1. So why can why is it possible that use Psi is better than use x2 directly? So let's look at this simple example of mixture of Gaussian. So for example, x1 comes from uh, uh, two clusters of Gaussian when y is minus one, it's centered at minus mu one. When y is one, it's centered at mu one. And the x2 is uh, similarly sampled from a uh, Gaussian distribution of mu uh, centered at mu2 or minus mu2. So in this example, x1 and x2 are conditional independent given y. And uh, if you calculate it, you can see that y condition x2 is not linear. It depends on the uh, probability density of uh, uh, Gaussian distributions. Uh, however, y condition per psi here is linear. If you calculate it, psi x1, which is x2 condition x1, is simply the probability of x1 comes from uh, class 1 times mu2, the center of x2, and uh, plus the probability of x1 comes from uh, cluster minus one times the other center minus mu two. So this interpolation between mu two and minus mu two. And uh, well, y condition x one is exactly just y equals to one. Uh, the probability of x one comes from cluster one minus the probability of x one comes from 
plus or minus one. And this is exactly just mu two dot product with uh, plus x one divided uh, normalized. So in, in this case, we can see that, oh, y condition on x two is not linear, but y condition on the side is linear. This actually comes from um, our assumption that x1 and x2 are independent given y. Okay, so now we know that uh, f star will be exactly equal to w star times plus x1. What do we show here? Uh, of, of course, we should also think about the case where it's not exactly conditional independent because it's too much, too strong an assumption. And uh, uh, given y and some latent variable z, we can actually capture the approximation uh, of conditional independence from, uh, from this epsilon ci. So let's not worry about it too much. Let's just say that this is the quantity that quantify how much um, correlation be between x1 and x2 given y and z. And uh, when they are exactly conditional independence, this value is zero. And we can show that our excess risk will be upbounded by k, the cardinality of y, times m, the cardinality of z, divided by number of samples, of downstream task plus epsilon ci that comes from the approximate conditional independence uh, plus epsilon pre that comes from that we do not learn the representation exactly. That comes from the error from pretext task. Uh, again, here excess risk is comparing uh, our learned model with the best possible model from uh, the function class. Uh, but, but here, if we assume that our function class has a universal approximation, uh, this is just uh, the conventional excess risk. And the uh, empirical risk minimization, so without the self surprise learning procedure, n will be complexity of the function class. And uh, with our previous example, we show that x2 might not uh, linearly predict y but besides one will do. And uh, uh, here excess risk is relative to the best predictor f star over all functions. And uh, so this procedure um, actually just use x2 to help select effective features from x1. So this idea is actually similar to uh, some prior work that use kernel method to um, that also utilize conditional independence. So there are some future directions. So here the in, in this talk we focused on the uh, statistical uh, part of the SSL, but we did not talk about any algorithms. So we, in the future, we may possibly focus on some algorithms for the representation learning. Uh, and also approximate conditional independence might not be generally applicable. So what are other conditions that can allow self supervised learning to work? This is another question that uh, we want to answer and explore in the future. Also, uh, in, in other words, um, in this work, we show that if approximate conditional independence is satisfied, then SSL will work. But we do not show that it is the only reason SSL works. So there might be some other reasons or other uh, criteria that can help us design uh, pretext tasks. We can explore it further in the future. Uh, also, in this work, we focus more on the reconstruction kinds of loss, which means we predict part of the input from the other parts. But uh, nowadays, people also um, use contrastive loss a lot. So we, in the future, we want to explore 
the relationship with contrasted loss versus reconstruction loss. And also here, you can see that in this result, only this part uh, is divided by an L. So even if we have abundant label data for the downstream task, we cannot reduce those parts. So this, those parts come from that um, when we learned X2 from X1, we lose some information. Uh, and the, this part with exact the procedure we described is not reducible. So in the future, we, we might want to investigate the uh, functionality of uh, fine tuning and possibly to reduce those errors furthermore. And uh, so this is basically what I want to talk about. Uh, um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's a very inspiring talk. Uh, so for the audience, if you have any question, please unmute or you can post in the chat as well. Uh, maybe let me first ask a quick uh, technical question. So I noticed in your second bond, uh, is KM instead of K plus M. Uh, can you illustrate why? What the, is there any intuition why this is the case? Yeah, it's basically um, because of in the first case, uh, first case we only considered linear problem, and uh, uh, so Y and Z does not interact. Uh, here, um, here Y and Z might interact. It's just uh, when we capture the correlation between X1 and X2 using Y and Z, it might be like, uh, so uh, Y, Z, and the, the interaction of Y and Z. So it will be the, the multiplication. Uh, so in the linear case, there's some uh, kind of independence because of the linearity that allows you to have a K plus M bond, is that the intuition? Yeah, so you don't this. care about the correlation between Y and Z? Yeah, so because everything is linear, so if we have the, the correlation is Y times C, then it's not linear anymore. So we don't care about their interactions. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, do you have lower bounds too? Uh, what do you mean lower bound? Like uh, this is the best rate you can get or you can't improve on that? Uh, I think so because um, so if we don't have don't have those then you can see that it's um, it's typical in statistical learning theory when you have like k plus m dimension of data to predict to do prediction, then it must be, uh, you need at least k plus m samples. I guess, I guess the other terms like uh, the minimum eigenvalue and, uh, you know, uh, the other terms in the setup, not necessarily just k plus m by m. Uh, yeah, uh, but we, we have some simulations and uh, see that, uh, yeah, it, the risk uh, is actually related to that. So to clarify, in your simulation, you show the dependency on beta is like a tight, or um, it's really the smallest in your model, or? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Not exactly, just uh, it's linearly related to that. I see. Um, what is the scaling of epsilon pre? Uh, is one over the number of unlabeled data, or something like this? Yeah. Yeah, for, so because it's not the focus of this work, uh, we did not specify what is epsilon free. But yeah, it's just uh, the accuracy we learned the uh, learn per psi. And the complexity of psi is uh, captured by epsilon free. Uh, um, say you have yeah, a function yeah, class. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So for example, we use a uh, neural net. To, to work with the pretext task. 
then epsilon pre will be the complexity of the neural network divided by um, by the number of samples we use in pre test task. Yeah, but uh, we usually assume that we have a uh, lots of lots of data for, mm -hmm. for pre test task because it's it's for free. Uh, so there's one question from the chat. Uh, so Feng Huang is asking uh, the assumption of conditional independence. For most natural photos, different parts of the photo should be correlated. Should this assumption be strict? Uh, this is the uh, first question. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, good point. So this is uh, what we have been emphasized here. So usually it's not exactly satisfied. So this is just for the sake of clean presentation. So we can see that if this is satisfied exactly, we have this uh, very good ideal property that F star is simply linear in the size one. But uh, uh, usually like uh, one, one for context encoder or other tasks, they might not be exactly conditional independence. So there the approximation is captured in this epsilon three and uh, the result will be um, this plus epsilon conditional independence. So that's also why in, in, in real applications, if we only learn a linear layer on top of it, um, it might be uh, not be very ideal because uh, we have lose something, but if we do fine tuning, we can possibly reduce this part. Uh, Feng, if you have more questions or want to interact with Chi, you can unmute. Yeah, I guess we have plenty of time. So uh, regarding the simulation, so we have showed that uh, we have do some simulations with linear or non-linear models and see uh, what we show is if conditional independence is satisfied, then uh, our results are correct, that the excess risk is um, it's linear in K and uh, uh, it's linear in epsilon continuous independence and epsilon free, etc. We show this. But uh, it's quite hard to uh, demonstrate the causality of like the success of SSL and the uh, um, conditional independence. And uh, even if we see some tasks uh, that satisfy conditional independence, we cannot simply just say that, oh, uh, conditional independence is the reason for the success of SSL. Thank you.